I hope I can make you guys uh, laugh, maybe cry a little bit. And most of all, leave here inspired, because I do have an extraordinary journey and why I started my uh, beautiful magazine. Um, I uh, want to, first of all, uh, thank James Lord for inviting me to one of my favorite cities in the whole world, London. And I want to welcome uh, those of you that traveled far from other countries to come and see amazing uh, speakers that have been here speaking, and uh, maybe to meet me as well. So I thank you for flying all the way here. And uh, those uh, people that are here from London, I love your city. Um, I love the vision here. And um, I will get started with my, uh, my journey. So I uh, was in the jewelry business. I uh, was very lucky to uh, meet a gentleman that asked me to come and intern for him. Uh, but I do want to put some things aside that people want to know. Yes, it's my real hair. <laughs> uh, J-Lo has extensions. I do not. It's all real. And I just cut it, actually, uh, four inches, just so you guys know. Uh, I'm not Greek. I am uh, Portuguese. And I was born originally in the Azores, in the island of Terceira. And I'm very proud of that. Um, my husband is Greek, though. He's my uh, Greek god, uh -huh. and sometimes my goddamn Greek. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to make sure I like got that over with. Okay, so um, I had an amazing, uh, extraordinary experience in the jewelry world, and then I was an engraver. And I used to be able to sell a lot of things to brides. And I was always intrigued, like, my God, I could like, sell these people anything. It's, this is like at the funeral. I, if, if they want you know, five bracelets, I can sell them 10. And I was really intrigued by this consumer. So um, a bride asked me to go to an event. Um, I, had no, I knew nothing about weddings, and I said, sure. Uh, she had a lot of money to spend. She wanted me to help her. I said, I know nothing about weddings, but I'll go with you. So when I went to the event, I was disgusted. I said, wow, this is like really bad. Like you can't hire anybody here. This is bad. And then I um, decided to do an event just to help people. So I started with my heart. Everything that I do is, you know, from here. So I decided to do one event, and I thought I was going to do it one time. I had no money. I decided, OK, I'm just going to look for the great people for this woman, and then I will find a place to do an event one time. And I thought, OK, who represents the best? And this is a long time ago, because most of you are very, very young. You probably don't even know who Robin Leach is. But I called the Lifestyles and Rich and Famous um, office in New York. And I said, I want to hire Robin Leach from Lifestyles and Rich and Famous. And they said, OK. And then they referred me to a, uh, a company called William Morris Agency. I didn't even know what William Morris was. So I just said, I just want to hire Mr. Leach to come and actually host my event, because he represented the best. And in those days, I mean, people had events. They don't charge brides. And from the beginning, I wanted to present something and bring couture gowns and really do it you know, in a very fabulous way for women with taste and style. And I thought I was only going to do it for Portuguese women, not realizing that the first event I hosted, I had 1,000, um, maybe 1,000 brides and 5,000 people that attended the event. So I guess we'll start with our first slide. Here I am with Robin Leach. And 10 years later, after 10 shows, I decided I'm going to do a magazine. Actually, I was going to do a, a program. I did a program, and a lot of people you know, wanted to know how they could buy ads in our magazine. And um, I said, well, you know, just I'll let you know how much it is. And I came home that evening, and I told my husband, I think I'm going to do a magazine. And he said, but you know nothing about publishing. And I said, 
uh, how hard could it be? People want to buy ads in the magazine. I think, you know, how hard could it be? So I will do it. So I had never looked at a magazine before. I had every magazine, Martha Stewart, uh, Brides by Demetrius, Brides Magazine, um, uh, another one that was infringing on my name, I think it was uh, Weddings in Style. All of them, they were all in my, um, in my show. And then uh, when I decided to do a magazine, I took one day and I looked at all of them and I said, this is not for me, none of it. And I decided, okay, who is taking care of the woman with style, the families that are spending this kind of money? Um, you know, who are these designers? Uh, I see no credit. I'm so glad the other young lady mentioned about credit. I think it's very important to give credit where it's due. And this is where I found myself um, feeling that I had to do a magazine for the event designers around the world that created these beautiful rooms and their vision and other people were taking their credit. So that's why Grace Ormond Wedding Style was born. It was for the event designers around the world. And the first <coughs> cover that I did was the one on the left that took us to my first, I, I call it my really first cover on the right. This is my secretary. In my first like formal photo shoot that I had in Newport, Rhode Island, you know, I hired a professional model and everything to come. And guess what? The model got lost. She didn't show up at the shoot. I find myself with my secretary and on the beach with a horse and a photographer and no model. And I said, Jennifer, you're going to have to go up on the horse. <laughs> So there she is, and this is such a very important photo for me because she passed away very young. And this cover um, sold 100% on newsstands in Barnes and Noble and um, Borders. And this is what put me on the map. Many years later, I get a phone call from uh, Time Inc. And they said they had never seen uh, magazines like sell so much on Barnes & Noble. I, mean, I didn't know nothing about publishing, I'm going to be honest with you guys. And we had sold every single magazine that we had put on newsstands just to like check it. And that was that cover and another cover that I did. And they called and they said they wanted to distribute our magazine on a national level. And could I have a meeting and could I come to New York? And I was very bold and I, didn't, I was not afraid to take a chance and to reach high. And, and I said, well, I'm interested, but you guys called me. Why don't you come to Rhode Island? Why do I have to come to New York? And this is like Time Inc. calling. I thought everybody got those calls. I had no idea. <laughs> so then they, uh, they came to Rhode Island, five men, and they decided um, they wanted to Ask me if I could take my magazine on a national level. And I met with them and I said, why not? Let's just go for it, let's try. And then uh, for about uh, 10, 12 years, we put out a quarter of a million copies every single time that we put out the magazine. So here we are today, right? <laughs> After many shoots around the world, when I first started the magazine, back in the, uh, like, now it's about 2004, uh, the internet was just becoming kind of popular and, you know, we had done our website. And I already had the vision about video and c connecting people. And I did a DVD, and I said, who's done a DVD in a magazine? And it's all Rolling Stones. And I said, why can't I do one? Nobody else has done one. So I called the guy in Montreal. I was printing the magazine in Montreal. I said, have you guys ever done a DVD? Uh, and they said, yeah, we, we've done it for Rolling Stone. What other magazine has ever done a DVD? And they said, Rolling Stone. And I said, well, I say, let's do a DVD. Quarter of a million uh, DVDs, and we can insert it in the magazine, and then we can like, let people know to go to the website. Um, so anyway, this is our, our first DVD, and we did a quarter of a million of them. A little bit ahead of my time, I thought. 
and I know this is something that she will talk to me about, but this is part of uh, what made our magazine kind of famous. And uh, this is also a, new, a room I want to put to bed. The reason why I started doing photo shoots with men is in many cultures, in, in the European cultures, um, we have the groom at the church holding the bouquet and welcoming our brides to the church. So I thought, why not shoot men in bouquets? It's a lot more sexy to look at, number one. And, uh, and that's what we did. And, and then we had like submissions from all over the world, like every nationality, every one sending over uh, the, the photography. And here I will uh, let your first question start, I believe. So our talk is obviously on content and curation, which you are a full expert in. Talk us through and share with all the delegates here and all the speakers, what is your process of curating content for your magazine? How does it work? My biggest thing is when I get thousands and thousands of submissions, you know, um, monthly and weekly, I take two days. Two days, I just look at content. I look at a lot of things that I don't want to look at. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but I have to look at it because you never know. It could be one photo that could be amazing. So I have to take that time and to actually look at it. People always ask, do you look at everything? Yes, I do. And um, I look for things that have emotion, style, design. Um, I don't pick things just because people spent a million or two million or three million or even five these days on weddings. I pick it because of the photography. Photography for me is number one. It has to tell me the story. If you look at the photography, this happens to be a couple that got married here in London. And it happens to be in my book. Those of you that got a book, you will see that I, I love this wedding. And they've asked me to put basically 37 years of photos and thought in, into 30 minutes. So I'm doing my best. And the reason why I like this is because it's timeless. You can look at this 50 years from now, and it will still be beautiful. This is why I think good photographers, good artists need to be respected. It's not people jumping up all over the place. Those have its place as well. But for someone to have a beautiful uh, feature in a magazine or to have a beautiful album, I think this is more fitting. And I like to pick uh, a lot of uh, cultures. I believe in diversity. And I like picking things with one color palette or two color palettes something that you look at and there's like a design. There was something that you actually, wow, they did this to not only impress, but there's a design element to it. There's a color palette to it. There was thought put into it. And of course it helps when some of these uh, brides uh, have customization, you know, with designers like Ralph and Russo. And I like picking photography that actually tells a story. So you don't have to pick a lot, imagine, uh, they shoot maybe 1,500, 2,000 pictures in the wedding, and I get down to like maybe 14 images. And I have to tell that story in 14 images. This is another wedding that uh, is one of my favorites that was designed by Ed Libby from New York. Um, I love him. I make no mistakes uh, and no secrets about what designers I love. And again, it's like the color palette, the design, Everything tells a story. Diversity, um, we have featured uh, gay men, and this is one of my favorites, and I wanted to put this one here especially because I like the fact that these guys didn't spend that much money, but they gave themselves beautiful watches, and their two dogs, and it was just like, they're just gonna go into a hotel, do the whole thing, just them two. So those are the, the kind of photos that I look for, things that move me. And I feel like if I pick something that moves me, then my readers, when they pick up the magazine, it will move them. Everyone wants to read about love. I mean, first in, in life, right, it's our health and love. Everything else probably doesn't matter. 
I'll wait for your next question. <laughs> so I was just going to go on to that. So obviously you're very big, as we saw, in crediting all the wedding planners, the creatives, you know, the photographers. Why is it so important to you? Because obviously even when I was an editor of a magazine, we'd only have like really small credits, but you really did change that. Why was that so important for you to bring that into your publication? Well, I, I believe that there's uh, event designers, especially event designers really, I started the magazine for them. I think they were not getting their best credit. I, I believe that there was a lot of planners at the time that didn't give them the credit they deserved. And people always have to like have a magnifying glass to see you know, who did the work. And I you know, really wanted to change that and start showing the work of the best people in the industry. And then we, we just like to credit them in the magazine. You know, for me, this is what a high-end client wants to see. They want to see, you know, who did it, how can I get it, and they want exclusiveness, and they want somebody that can design their vision. It's very simple. Those rules never change. I don't think they've changed from the 70s until actually now. Yeah, it's really important, and, and as I'm sure everyone agrees, the visuals are beautiful. Um, what challenges did you face? Obviously, it's the C words, it's the whole theme of our whole symposium. What challenges did you face when you were developing the brand of the magazine, especially with all the competition of the other bridal magazines that you had there? I think what kept me where I was, it was about my taste, and, and I, I think they had no taste. Or maybe they did, and they could not, um, you know, use the pages in the way that maybe their editors might want it to. And when they're corporate, it's all about you know who's paying, who is paying, who is paying. For me, I could do whatever I wanted. So if I fell in love with this designer today, and I, I saw his work, and I said, oh my God, it's going to be four pages for him. That could be like a forty thousand dollar exposure for them, but I don't, I don't care because that's what I want to show in that particular magazine. Amazing. That's what's good when you're your own boss, right? <laughs> you don't have anybody telling you what to do. And now obviously, you get so inundated with so many different weddings from all over the world. Inspirational. How do you really? I know you touched upon it earlier. How do, if any of these amazing brands here, we've got lots of suppliers, amazing creators, and creatives here. How do they go through the process of submitting an amazing wedding or their work or a photo shoot, as Lauren was talking about, collaborative photo shoot? How do they go about what's the process they need to go to for submitting it to your magazine? I'm probably the easiest person to submit to. All you have to do is actually submit. It does come to my desk. 90% um, of everything you see on the website, I pick myself. It's hard. I'm not going to say it's not hard. That's why we, we don't do a lot of numbers, but I am looking at it. Because I want to control my brand. I don't want to be just another website. You know, we have women that come on our site from New York, from Miami, from a lot of the top markets, and they buy out hotels. And they don't expect to see, you know, all this noise, or, you know, and I try to control that as much as I can, as I do in the magazine as well. So it's so easy, guys. You go up to, uh, you know, weddingstylemagazine.com, submissions. Send it in Dropbox, because that's the best way that I like to look at things. Send Dropbox, I go, I look, I say, okay, I want these 10 images, or I want this to be on the web, I want this for print, and I tell one of my editors to reach out to you guys and say, she wants this for this reason. It's that simple. So I welcome you to send in. So Grace, you curate most of your bridal shoes as well, as we saw you know, from your very first one. Um, a lot of the big brands, the very luxury high-end brands, they really trusted you from when you did the whole transition from doing the biggest wedding shows to then obviously going on to the magazine. What was it about the brands that believed in you so much to be able to deliver these high luxury campaigns? I stay true to my brand. I think this is very hard, I think, for people today, especially with social media. And I just never went, you know, south or I just stayed my course. Stayed true to my brand. And they trusted you. And your smile, of course, which you mentioned to me. <laughs> my smile, yeah. My smile helps. 
Now, obviously, you've been renowned for trend setting. I know you don't believe in trends, but when earlier you showed the visual of the grooms, you did a campaign, you create, curated a shoot with grooms holding bouquets. Where did the inspiration of that come from? Because obviously, normally, traditionally, it's brides that carry bouquets, but you changed that and it went viral. Where did the inspiration come from for that campaign? Well, I, I touched upon it um, in the beginning. It's um, a, a lot of our cultures, you know, we have the groom holding the bouquet at the church to welcome the bride. But when I started looking at the ma other magazines and I said, you know, they have these women holding the magazines, these tacky photos. and This is not like who I am. I, you know, this is not cool. This is not avant-garde. This is not fashion. I wanted the magazine to evolve, you know, to have this high fashion. I didn't want to show wedding shoes. I wanted to show Christian Lovatan, Giuseppe Zanotti. I wanted to, you know, these brides are shoppers. They want to wear fashion. So I decided to, you know, start showing more of that in the magazine. You wanted to show things that are unique and share yeah. them in different ways, which is really important. Now, obviously, we touched upon this earlier on social media as well. There's been a big shift in the industry where, obviously, digital media is much more paramount before. I mean, how have you adapted to this, being obviously a print publication? Do you think your magazine will become digital in the future or in the next five years? Well, for sure. I mean, like, you know, we're all in a digital world. And um, I focused on creating a website that didn't feel like all that noise. Um, I think social media is an amazing thing. I, um, I think video is one of the most important things, by the way. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one of the most important things at a wedding, uh, I think today, is, is definitely uh, photography and film at the end of the day. What is your favorite part of a wedding? And you've attended many weddings, I'm sure. Which one's been your favorite? One of my uh, most memorable weddings, and I've been invited to a lot of them, um, but I was invited uh, for many, many years, uh, or I mean, I think at least six or eight months, there was a woman kept contacting my office, and I, I have to come to Austria, I have to come to Austria, she's married a count, and um, I finally you know, said yes, that I would come, and, um, and that was my, this was many years ago, by the way, and that was my first experience actually having an experience at a wedding. You know, those weddings that you go and you, you know, you have a nice time and then you're driving home on the highway and you take the wedding favor and you throw it away <laughs> on the highway? <laughs> Most of us have been to those weddings at some point. But uh, this wedding, it was actually a very special wedding um, because the minute that we arrived, you know, they had, you know, uh, an amazing welcome for their guests that flew in for a long time. Uh, then they took people um, on the train over in, from Vienna over to where they filmed um, Sound of Music. And they had this, like, beautiful chapel and the bride and groom are uh, total fantasy. You know, they come out of the helicopter, then they walk in. And then um, they, this, this was like so amazing because I, 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 at one point I thought I was in Portugal. And they, you know, come out of the church and then they have this marching band and then the marching band starts to like play and the bride and groom are following this beautiful marching band up this beautiful hill into this like fairy tale castle and all the guests are parading behind them for a luncheon. And on the way, on the train, they serve truffle and champagne all the way. And then we have this beautiful lunch, and then they get back on these buggies, and then, you know, in beautiful heels, and now you're on this little horse carriage. And then they bring you back to the train, more champagne, more truffle, and back to Vienna, go to the hotel, rest a bit, take a shower, get dressed, put your evening gown, and then go, back in a horse carriage in Vienna at night, listening to opera music, and then you go into this amazing um, venue, and now the, the evening is the Amadeus uh, theme. So you walk in and they give you a, a mask, 
and they have like all this amazing food and the, it's like a very sexy night. It's, it's just a very, that, I have to say that was my most memorable uh, wedding. Wow, it sounds really magnificent. That, that's why I recommend giving your guests an experience. And um, another rumor I'd like to uh, put to bed is that I've never planned uh, a wedding. <laughs> uh, I've never, I'm not a wedding planner. I've only planned my own. And um, I believe in, in giving your guests an experience. And, and that's what I did. I, and back in those days, um, wedding planning was just becoming, you know, um, started to be, get big. And I planned my own wedding because I wanted um, to have um, uh, experiences with music. Because my, my father-in-law was a singer, my brother-in-law was a singer. Um, and I was friendly with Jeffrey Osborne's brother. Those of you that don't know Jeffrey Osborne, um, he sang uh, On the Wings of Love. And uh, his brother was a famous uh, jazz musician. And um, I asked him to play at my wedding. So he said yes. So I had to plan the music, the minute by minute, experience by experience, so my guests could, you know, have that experience. So. Sounds amazing. <laughs> so you publish your magazine twice a year and it's yeah. distributed globally. Mm -hmm. Where can we find your magazine, especially here in London? We are in first class lounges, business class lounges, and uh, places like Heathrow um, and Charles de Gaulle. All the wedding venues that we've picked in France and also in Italy, Mexico, Caribbean, Miami, New York, California, and here in London, Harrods and some castles. And now we're looking into the hotels here as well. Amazing. Getting into this market in a bigger way. Now, what would your advice be? We've got amazing variety here in the room, obviously with creatives, suppliers, venues. What would your advice be to them in terms of curation and you know making a mark and being unique and standing out from their competitors? Um, not being afraid to take a chance. You know, I took a chance and then many years later I realized that half a million of you love what I do. It's amazing. And I think that if you believe in yourself, just go for it. You know, even if somebody says to you, oh God, that's impossible. And people said it was impossible that I would ever, how could I compete with Time Inc? Uh, very well. They had no taste. I had taste. <laughs> so I say, don't be afraid. Like, just do it. And you can make a mark if you decide, okay, this is what I want to do. This is the mark I wanted to make. I wanted to speak to people that had taste, style, money, a lot of money, no taste. <laughs> I wanted to speak to them. And I thought, you know, no one was really thinking about those people. And I also wanted to be the magazine that didn't show the ugly bald guy with a, just the blonde girl with the big breasts. I wanted to be the magazine that spoke to how I see the world. And I wanted to show every uh, culture. I show a lot of Indian weddings. I show a lot of Persian weddings. I, I've shown Greek weddings, um, Pakistan, Philippines. I believe in culture. I think cultural uh, weddings are very beautiful. So I wanted to um, show diversity in my magazine and how I see the world. Great advice, Anne. Thank you. Because when we did see the magazine, how many of you received the beautiful copy that um, Grace has kindly gifted to us? Right. So if any of you didn't get those, please do come and see me because I know a lot of the delegates weren't there on the opening night. Please do come and see me. And on that note, Grace, you obviously are the author of the book as well, which is it called Love Never Goes Out of the Style, which you published in 2010. What inspired you to write your own book? Love. <laughs> um, I really wanted to do it as a thank you uh, to the photographers that captured um, the most beautiful photography. Um, I, I was very honored to work with so many amazing photographers and people that shot food well. And um, 
I wanted to uh, kind of do a, a tribute to the event designers and the wedding planners that had, you know, produced such beautiful events that I was able to pick some amazing things. 90% of the stuff in the book we actually shot with um, every event designer, and the other stuff was uh, submitted. It's beautiful, honestly. Thank you so much for gifting this to each one of our delegates and speakers. And finally, what is next for you? What are your plans for the future? What oh, can we expect? My God. A Greek island, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, definitely we're looking at the digital thing. You know, I'm, uh, I'm working on a very, actually, special project uh, professionally that I cannot talk about, but uh, hopefully that will come uh, soon. And, you know, uh, personally, I'm uh, back in the canvas and, you know, trying to paint, take a little more time for myself. Although I've, I've spent a lot of time traveling. Um, these days, I like to stay home. And your, sec <laughs> and your second home. Just <laughs> London, my no? second home, London, yes. <laughs> amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause for the amazing Grace. <laughs> now, I know a few of you want to ask um, some questions, so we can open up to you guys. My Thank you very much. As a filmmaker, I didn't really um, expect to have much interaction with the magazine. And I'm wondering if you, maybe you can put me straight, if there's something that, you know, how, how can a filmmaker you know, connect with a, with, a, with a publication like yourself? I think we should speak. <laughs> I, I think it's a brilliant idea, because this is exactly why I was saying I was a little bit ahead of my time. When I actually did my DVD, in those days, they didn't have like you know video. They didn't have Instagram. They, they just had a website, basically for presence of, for your brand. And I even back then I was thinking, wait a minute, like, what if I, you know, have a filmmaker follow me and I drop in and I interviewed somebody like Colin Cowie, and we dropped in and we went to and interviewed somebody like Ree Macra and we put these things on the video and was able to actually put it inside the magazine. And I think people really liked it. And it was that automatic connection. So I think it's a very important um, film. Um, I, I, didn't I wanted to mention this, uh, other things that people always ask me, you know, what is the most, thing, most important thing that you think is in a wedding? And I have to say, it, it's not about you know, more flowers you put on the ceiling and you know, and more and more and more. It's really about, at the end, is having the experience for the guests, the food, the entertainment. By the way, I want to thank, like, I was li listening to you sing, the singer that was uh, uh, over here a little bit ago. I think they were, like, pretty amazing. Um, so I think if you mess up the entertainment and you mess up the food and the experience for your guests, you've missed it. You've missed it. So th those are the most important things. And the photography and the video, because the first time when I came back from my honeymoon, I wanted to see the video. So people that like say, well, video is not so important. Video is the most important. And photography for me, for, sh for sure. At the end, this is all you have left. You've spent all this money, especially these uh, clients that spend a million, two million dollars and somebody messes up their photography and they don't have a good filmmaker, to me that's a crime. So wedding planners, if you're hearing me, hire the right filmmakers and hire the right photographers to capture uh, this experience. Because I also think that's how you also get good press as well. <laughs> and I think we have time for one more final question from Farima. Grace, Karina Perry here. Um, Grace, going back to your job, really, um, what's the one skill that you wished you had learned before you became an editor? Have you had any, any, thought, any regrets as in, oh, I wish I'd done that before I did this? No, because I, I, I didn't know anything about publishing. So, I um, mean, looking back, um, do I have regrets? Not really. I don't have regrets. I I did it my way, as they say. I had a lot of fun um, along the journey myself, and I, I created a magazine, and I wanted to 
Um, did I help a lot of people get famous? Yes, um, but that was the idea. That's what I enjoy. That's what gives me joy. And I hope to continue to do that as long as I can possibly can. I will do it as long as I am able to do it. Uh, so that's, I think, truly inspirational. Thank you so much for coming all the way from New York or Rhode Island to come be with us today. And Thank I hope you, you guys are just an honor to uh, speak with you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your time.